This video is brought to you by my patrons and YouTube members who support my channel so I can continue to make narrative content like this. Hey guys, this is Eric with Pixel Rookie, and this is episode 10 of the Chronicles of Rook. Before we get started, I wanted to shout out my buddy Nate who did my thumbnail art for this episode. Now normally I draw my own art for my thumbnails, but man, look how much better of a job he did. Can you please show him some love and support by clicking on the card in the top corner of the video and checking out his YouTube channel? He and his friend make some great stuff and it's always awesome to help out smaller YouTube channels. Check them out and subscribe if you like what you see. Seriously, thanks for the help, Nate. I also want to shout out my Discord user Bold and Brash who got a Chronicles of Rook poster and sent me a pic of it. Looks great, man. And finally, I want to shout out my patron Michael Lannister who sent me a pic of him sporting a Pixel Rookie t-shirt. If you guys want to support the channel and look good while doing it, check out the Chronicles of Rook shirt or poster. Anyways, back to the video. Last episode, Rook replaced his severed arm with a robotic limb. They recruited Ryan, Purple, and Rockius during their travels, and Rook was reunited with another falling son. At the end of the episode, the men were exploring Hang. Rook learned that if he were to assassinate the leader of the Shek, they would go into an all-out war with the Holy Nation. What was Rook going to do moving forward? Rook's thoughts were weighed down with the information that Yamdu shared with him. He didn't speak too much to the other men as they were leaving town. While the men sensed something was off, they were still in high spirits and tried to encourage Rook to cheer up a little. He smiled at them and engaged in conversation, pushing his deeper thoughts of future hard decisions to the back of his head for the time being. They left Heng to travel north to another city called Heft as they continued exploring the Great Desert. Rook's mood quickly lifted while he ran through the dry desert and chatted with the other four men about their goals as they continued growing New Raleigh. Even Rockius, who was naturally a pretty big downer, seemed like his spirit was higher by the company of their traveling party. After running for a short period of time, they could see Heft off in the distance, another city to explore that was owned by the United Cities, looking to see what they could find. Rook's men found the bar to rest and relax for a bit while Rook checked out the city's HQ. It was open to the general public and while Rook was looking around, he realized that Emperor Tengu resided here. Was this a Tengu of Tengu's vault? Was Heft the capital of the United Cities? Rook was feeling ballsy and decided to approach Tengu and see if he would speak with him. As he got closer, Tengu lazily looked him over with extreme disinterest. Suddenly, he got an excited look on his face. He saw that Rook was a fighter and he said he was waiting for a swordsman like him and how an ancient grieve wraith was plaguing his land. He tasked Rook on a quest to slay this monster and he would give him anything he wants. It all sounded bizarre, but he thought he would humor Tengu and ask what he needed to do. He continued to ramble on with a lot of nonsense and while Rook was drifting off, Tengu handed him a gross sack that he was to present to some kind of skeleton wizard or something. It emitted an unpleasant smell, but he put it in his backpack as he didn't want to offend this lunatic. Tengu bid him his farewell and began hacking and shaking uncontrollably. As he began coughing and wheezing, all the guards ran towards him and knocked Rook out of the way while they were trying to get the royal seal. Rook was equally as confused as he was disgusted. This was the Emperor of the United Cities, the one who let slavery run rampant as a vast trade. Rook was at a loss of words for what he just witnessed. This put him in a bad mood and despite the insane Emperor Tengu, he decided he would steal his goods. It's not like he would need them anyways. He was out of sight and he opened the chest that was full of food. His group was low on supplies so he figured it would stock up. His robotic arm was a little less subtle than the fleshy human arm and it made enough noise that he was noticed. Tengu yelled for the guards to arrest Rook so he took off running down the HQ as quickly as he could. A whole group of men followed him out of the entrance as he tried to escape. Rook continued running to the exit of Heft, but two guards continued to pursue him. He figured he would lose him in the desert and meet back up with the others later on. There was a city across the Great Desert that he could easily go to and eventually shake these annoying guards. Tengu's guards were extremely persistent. Rook ran for hours and they still didn't let up. He finally lost them through Sho Batai, and since he was out of the way, he thought he would check out this Fort Mirage that he saw marked on his map close by. As Rook ran down a large sand dune, he saw a lone structure hidden by the desert sands. The barracks was locked up, but he was curious as to what was inside, so he picked the lock and made his entrance. There was a man by the door, and he didn't seem very happy to see Rook come in unannounced. He yelled at Rook, but he smiled at the stranger and kindly greeted him, asking who they were. The man didn't take that very well and responded to Rook by lunging at him with his weapon. Big mistake. Rook blocked the attack, and in one swing, the man toppled to the ground. Four more men ran over and attacked Rook before he could explain that this was just a big misunderstanding. When Rook fought, it was like his falling son became an extension of himself as he would gracefully swing the giant blade down on his enemies, taking more than one person out in a single blow. These guys didn't really stand a chance against Rook. He kept trying to talk them down from attacking him, but they wouldn't let up. The final opponent lost his arm to Rook before he took him out. It was much quieter now in the hideout, and he checked out Lord Mirage's loot. He had rolls of cats in his pockets, and Rook figured he would take it as an inconvenience fee for attacking him on sight. Rook was examining the area until he heard more footsteps approaching him. 
another man came running at him ready to strike. He let out another sigh and approached his opponent. He melted like butter under Rook's first swing. Another man came down to face him. Why were they coming at him one at a time? The other fighters got up to join him. They were able to land some blows on Rook during the fight, but they were attacking him with metal pipes. Rook's body was hardened and tough from all of his combat experience up to this point. These metal pipes hardly phased him. The last man fell to Rook's mighty fallen son. The United Heroes League were now hostile towards Rook. Go figure. He tended to his bruises and searched the building. There wasn't really anything of interest here, and he realized it was past due time for him to meet back up with the others now. He ran out the front door and began running through the great desert again. It was a desolate place, but it had a certain beauty to it, he thought to himself as he ran through the large sand dunes. He ran south until he met up with the other men outside of the city of Strote. This was the final city they were going to visit before heading back west towards New Raleigh. There was nothing of interest here, so they left right away. They continued moving west until they saw a small way station on their way and stopped for a brief visit. Rook met with Mac by the shopkeeper and told him to try and sell some of the Leviathan pearls. He was able to sell one, but these pearls fetched such a high price that they couldn't afford any more of them. They would just have to find another place to sell their goods, Mac told Rook with a smile. Rook told him that they would need to head back to New Raleigh and sell them at the way station there, but he wasn't going with them. Rook let the men know that he was going to continue exploring other areas while they went back home to further develop New Raleigh. They knew better than to object Rook's decision and they said their goodbyes and parted ways. As they were leaving, Rook found an unexplored outpost further east and marked that as his current destination. He wanted to use this time to clear his head and consider his plan moving forward. That was until he entered Venge and almost got obliterated by a beam of light falling from the sky. As he continued traveling, he saw a settlement nearby. He's never met any Reavers before. He immediately regretted his decision as he approached the gate and one of the guards ran up to him claiming that they were chaos and he began opening fire at him with a crossbow. Rook made a mental note. Reavers are bad. Good to know. He took off running and continued towards the outpost further into the unexplored land. He hoped he wasn't going to run into any more of those guys anytime soon. Instead, he saw something very interesting. Massive crabs fighting off men in the distance. Those things looked powerful and terrifying. He did his best to run past them unnoticed. The closer he got to the eastern coast, the more bizarre things were becoming. He discovered a nearby settlement and he detoured north to see what it was. As he got closer, he could see it looked like a small sea village, but there were more of those massive crabs. This was a town owned by the Crab Raiders. The name seemed fitting enough for them. He decided to risk approaching the crabs and ran into town. They seemed passive towards him, but the townsfolk kept criticizing him for not having his own crab. Rook wasn't sure if he was ready to crab up or not, but he thought he would explore the town and see what it had to offer. There was a crab smithy shop, so Rook ran in and checked it out. While browsing the store's wares, Rook saw that they carried something called crab armor. He recalled the men fighting with the giant crabs outside of town were wearing this armor and it looked incredible. Your entire body would be protected while wearing this thing, he thought to himself as he examined it. Rook smiled as he just had another one of his great ideas. The crab people seemed very uninterested in him and his lack of crab pets, so he used this opportunity to sneak into the corner of their shop and check out a safe. He casually picked the lock and slowly opened it to see what was inside. It was exactly what he was hoping for. There were blueprints for this amazing crab armor inside. The other men were still ignoring Rook, so he slowly pulled the blueprints out of the safe and into his bag before quietly shutting it back up. He saw that one of the pieces were missing, but he found it in another chest. He managed to steal it as well. He left the store and ran down the ramp. This was perfect. They could use these plans to manufacture their own armor for his men back in New Raleigh. In fact, it seemed like the perfect kind of armor to wear if you were to assault a force like the Holy Nation. Rook finally had a moment of clarity. This was the answer to his burning question. He began to make his way back west to New Raleigh to meet the other men. Wamsnot, Mac, Purple, and Rockius were almost back there themselves. They spent some time recovering from their travels at Shark before they risked traveling through the dangerous swamp back to New Raleigh. Back home, the other men were doing well. Tal was at peace when he worked the fields to yield crops to feed the men. He was teaching Awinger the tricks of working the land. Hivers normally had a natural talent at farming. They were becoming good friends bonding as the only two Hivers of New Raleigh. Fravatar was becoming an exceptional cook as he would prepare all the crops and the meals for everyone to eat. The three of them would joke that they were the backbone of New Raleigh. Without them, everyone else would starve to death. As their funds were growing, so were their supplies that they were slowly building up. It was time to expand their base even further with a new construction. They planned to use this as their armory. It was a large space and they furnished it with armor chests, weapon racks, and other places for storage. As Rook made his way back home, he discovered more locations that potentially had more treasure. He found a lone tower in a desolate area. It definitely looked promising. 
He easily picked the lock and the door slowly creaked open. Rook snuck inside. There was a small security spider nearby. He had to sneak past it. He went around the other side and began unlocking chests and digging through them. This chest had a particularly complex lock. He was excited to open it and see what contents were inside. The lock finally let loose and he opened it up. Inside was a masterwork dust coat. It was sleeveless, but the quality was exceptional. He quietly swapped coats and put his back into his bag. He was carrying too much loot, so he left the armored rags in the chest and continued to loot. He was feeling ballsy and tried to pick the lock right by the spider. This went about as good as he expected and the spider turned to attack him immediately. For such a small robot, that thing sure did pack a punch. His time there was finished and he took off running back to his home. He felt at peace with himself. He didn't know if he would have even been able to go through with trying to assassinate Osada, even if he wanted to use the Shek to fight the Holy Nation for him. But this wasn't their fight, it was his, and with this ability to mass produce crab armor for his men, he felt confident that they would be able to become strong enough and better geared to go head to head against the Holy Nation. He progressed a little further and discovered that a strange town was nearby. What made this town so strange? He had to investigate to see what this strange town was all about. He arrived and found out this place was called Flats Lagoon. He stopped to look it over. It sure didn't seem that strange from here. He entered Flats Lagoon and looked around the town for a bit. When he entered the bar, a Scorchlander man called Rook over to speak to him. He could tell by Rook's gear that he was an adventurer. He told Rook that he was an adventurer himself. Harry tells me you're quite the adventurer. You know, I'm something of a adventurer myself. Through the conversation, the man explained his skills in unarmed combat and tried to brag about how close he was to entering the Ashlands. Rook smiled and told him that he's been to the heart of the Ashlands and back, and lived to tell the tale. The man was very impressed, and Rook used this opportunity to explain his cause to bring down the Holy Nation. The man paused for a moment to consider his decision. After some contemplation, he agreed to join Rook's team if he paid him 9,000 cats. Their funds were higher than normal, and he liked the idea of a martial artist being part of his group, so he agreed and they shook on his offer. The Scorchlander named Chad joined Rook. Rook promised him that they would one day take him to the Ashlands with him so he could see it for himself. They hung out for a little while longer, but it was time for Rook to take Chad back to his home at New Raleigh. He set it as their destination and they began traveling northwest. They stopped at a way station briefly where Chad visited a plastic surgeon. Like everyone who joins Rook's cause, he changed his name to Sparta, a new beginning for him as his story was now intertwined with Rook's. Back home, the men continued to prepare their armory with their own armor smithy. To craft their own armor, they would need to make their own armor plating. This new building would be their workshop and storage for their production. They quickly constructed their workstations and Ryan designated himself as New Raleigh's armor smith. This was a passion he always had but never pursued. None of the men were skilled in this trade, so he took this as an opportunity to learn the craft and begin building armor plates. Late that evening, Rook returned with Sparta and brought him in to meet the rest of the men. It felt good being home again and even better since Rook had a better plan with what their strategy would be moving forward. Something he didn't expect though was that the Holy Nation sent a large force to New Raleigh to try and sack their settlement. There were beast traders outside too, patiently waiting for them to open their gates to invite them in so they could sell their wares. The men were scared of the Holy Nation's forces, but Rook kept us cool. They would most likely attempt their attack during the day. The last time the Holy Nation attacked, they didn't have their walls to protect them and they were caught off guard. This time, Rook had an idea. First of all, he had Sparta trade his equipment with Fravatar. He wanted him to be weighed down so he could go up to the hub and train his martial art combat skills. As Sparta snuck out of the back gate, Rook told his men to wait for him inside the walls while he went out alone to lure the Holy Nation to him. He left the east gate open just long enough that the forces would approach it and try to get in. The gate closed before they could enter, but little did they know that a Shek patrol was also trying to pass through the gate. This is when the men noticed Rook was left outside, vulnerable to their attack. Before they could make a decision, Rook shouted out to the Shek, Our enemy is amongst us, fight with me, as he charged into the men. The Shek warriors turned on the Holy Nation. Rook bluffed with his charge and stayed back, luring only a few of the men towards him while the Shek fighters took on the rest of the men. Purple and Mac heard the commotion and ran to mount their gate's defensive turrets to pick them off from the wall. Rook fought off the two men that engaged with them easily enough. He saw that the Shek warriors were taking the brunt of the fighting and witnessed how powerful they truly were. In the corner of his eye, he saw the other merchants coming closer to the gate. This is what Rook was hoping would happen. The Holy Nation had a bad reputation with the nomads. They were considered outcasts that didn't worship Okran. As Rook ran to engage with the rest of the enemy forces, the merchants used this opportunity to help reinforce the men. Not only that, but skin spiders were being drawn to the bloodshed too. It was chaos outside of the gates of New Raleigh. The Holy Nation forces expected to break their walls and pillage Rook's home. 
Instead, they were surrounded by multiple different groups that came together, overwhelmed their unit, and crushed them into submission. Rook was back to back with a Shek warrior, fighting off the remaining paladins. He could hear the sounds of bolts being fired from Mac and Purple, who were still manning the turrets on the wall. Rook moved up the steps towards the gate and took down the remaining Holy Nation paladins that still stood. With the help of the other men, they crushed the Holy Nation assault with minimal damages received. He thanked the men and welcomed them to New Raleigh as the gates opened back up. Rook ran inside to rest and recover from the battle. To celebrate, they offered their newfound allies food and shelter for the day to show their gratitude. While all this was going on, Sparta was further north fighting a group of starving bandits he encountered. It didn't go that well. Once he regained consciousness, he walked to Squin and rented a bed for the day so he could rest. The idea of wearing armor that could increase his toughness at the expense of his combat skills sounded good for training in theory, but it was just too difficult for his current skill level. Meanwhile, Ryan was honing his skills and crafting equipment for the men, and he sewed Sparta a martial arts outfit. This would help improve his martial arts skills much more than Fravatar's armor did. He felt much more comfortable and confident in this outfit, so Rook escorted Sparta back out of the safety of the walls of New Raleigh to the hub so he could continue his training against starving bandits as he improved his fighting technique. Sparta knew that Rook was a powerful warrior. He wanted to become as strong as him one day. Until then, he had to keep training. Ryan had devoted all of his free time to mastering the art of armor smithing. He was excited by the crab armor plans that Rook brought back with him and was able to craft higher quality versions of it now. Fravatar was chosen as the first man to gear up in the first set of equipment. He was quite excited. Ryan worked hard on crafting the set of armor and after many hours of working in the smithy, it was finished. Fravatar anxiously put the last piece of the set on his legs and went back out to work. It was heavy armor, but it offered excellent protection and coverage. Rook parted ways with Sparta and continued north back to World's End. He entered the front gate with a specific goal in mind. Mac had a masterful ranged weapon that he found quite some time ago, but they had no bolts for ammunition. He thought he remembered them selling the blueprints on how to craft these bolts here at World's End. In order to build an army and properly equip them, they would need to be able to craft their own supplies. He found a specialty ranged weapon shop at the back of town. He entered and spoke with the vendor. They only had one research blueprint, and it was specifically for the heavy bolts that Mac's weapon required. He purchased it and thanked the man. This brought him one step closer to what they needed. They would be able to begin manufacturing ammunition immediately. Mac would be pleased. Rook looked over his map to return home, but he had a realization. The Holy Nation attacked them yet again, and he wouldn't let that stand. He saw a location on his map in their territory called Narco's Trap. Rook was going to take the fight to them and see what he could do on his own. He thanked the shopkeeper and left. His time at World's End was over for now. On his way there, he noticed another landmark on his map called Okren's Fist. This was closer than Narco's Trap, and Rook wanted to investigate these areas and see what was there. He set course to Okren's Fist and left the mountains where World's End sat. He arrived at his destination at midnight. It was a small fortress. It looked like it was well guarded, but Rook was a master of stealth. Maybe he could sabotage this outpost and slightly weaken the Holy Nation. He felt a little uneasy going in alone, but he was tired of sitting back idly and letting the Holy Nation try to bully his men into submission. Using the darkness of the night as his cover, he successfully snuck past the guards and the other soldiers patrolling the perimeter. There were more men here than he initially expected. Rook ran into a nearby building that was completely empty. He got through safely. After taking a moment to regain his composure, Rook began to stealthily move to the next building. He stepped inside unnoticed but paused. A whole group of men were sleeping past the entryway. He wanted to play it safe and explore his surroundings before doing anything too reckless, so he snuck back outside, weaving through the shadows and buildings until he entered what looked like a small weapon storage. Maybe he could snag some good loot, he thought to himself. But as he ran past the door, he realized a guard was stationed here, and he ran right into him. He sprinted past him into the end of the hall and engaged the Holy Sentinel. He blocked Rook's swing and yelled out in his counterattack. This raised the alarm and he heard more men running to his location. This wasn't good. Rook was locked in combat with him and he was certain that more men were coming from his only exit. He tried to bring the sentinel down before reinforcements arrived, but he couldn't do enough damage. Three more soldiers poured into the weapon storage and surrounded Rook. It was time to get serious. He was able to block most of their attacks, but they still landed blows on Rook. He continued to focus on the guard he already weakened. He had to take these guys out before more came. He kept his back against the wall so he couldn't get fully surrounded by the men. The arc of every swing from the falling sun was huge. He was able to hit three or even all of them in one attack. Half the men fell to the ground. The other two pushed him against a safe and got some good hits on him again. If he got knocked out, he was finished. He kept focusing on the final men. One more fell. Just one guy left and he was in the clear. Well, that was until a passing guard heard the commotion and ran in to investigate and join the combat. Rook was determined though. He was hurt, but it wasn't critical. He took another down. 
Hopefully this was the last guy. They locked swords in a brief duel before Rook slammed his weapon into the sentinel's side and he crumbled to the ground. Rook's adrenaline was pumping. For taking out five Holy Nation guards, he didn't suffer too much damage. He quickly patched up his wounds and prepared himself to see what else he could sabotage here. He snuck into another barracks where more paladins were sleeping. Rook had the bright idea of knocking each of the men out while they slept and stealing their equipment. He ran up to the first paladin and swung his arms as powerfully as he could. It was a dull thud and he knew he was knocked out cold. He did not think a high paladin would fall for the same ploy, so he went over to the next paladin. Rook swung his arms down, but he bumped his target's bed which caused him to wake up. The paladin yelled out and the rest of the men jumped to their feet. Rook knew that this was too much and it was time for him to make his exit. The men leapt out of bed and tried to surround Rook, but he was too fast. He sprinted towards the gate as the men were following closely behind, screaming at him. The men at the gate didn't notice him yet. He used this opportunity to his advantage as he braced his shoulder and ran through the group of them. He heard bolts being shot at him from the walls, but he was fortunate and escaped without getting harmed. He laughed to himself as he made it up to the hill beyond Okran's fist. He was in the clear, at least he thought he was. As he knelt down to patch himself up, he saw that a large group of them followed him to the outskirts of their base. Rook wanted to be the one sending a message this time. Instead of running, he turned to fight. He could take them on. More of the men were pouring in around him though. Maybe he bit off more than he could chew. If his attacks landed, they did massive damage to his targets, but there are so many of them, he had trouble blocking all the incoming attacks. By now, Rook was very familiar with this deadly dance of steel. He would gracefully maneuver between the men, regaining his composure quickly if they struck him with their weapons. He managed to take two of them down with one swing. Good. He only needed to do that a few more times and he would be in the clear. He missed his next attack and they all landed hits on him. He really felt that one. To make matters worse, he heard more reinforcements through the trees coming for him. This was too much. He had to retreat. His left leg was pretty banged up and he was slowed down. The men were in hot pursuit trying to chase him down. He couldn't get caught. No, he wouldn't get caught, he told himself as he heard footsteps of a holy sentinel closing in on him. And this is where we're going to end this episode. Will Rook be able to successfully escape from the Holy Nation soldiers at Okran's Fist? Stay tuned for the next episode to find out. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Here's some awesome fan art for your viewing pleasure. If you want to share your artwork and have it featured in a future episode, be sure to join my Discord and submit your art in the fan art channel. Your skill level doesn't matter. Any work that a fan puts effort into is greatly appreciated. The link to the Discord server is in the description below. If you want to see more of this series or any of my other narrative videos, please subscribe to the channel and I'll keep making content like this. If you want to help support the channel even further, please consider being a patron or a YouTube member, where you'll have access to all kinds of great perks and allow me to continue devoting more of my time making these types of videos. I also want to use this opportunity to shout out my newest YouTube members, Misheru and Wubwub. Thank you both so much for your awesome support. I hope you enjoy your cool badge icon. And a big, big thanks to my many patrons who are generously supporting my channel so that I can one day make this a full-time job and push out much more content like this regularly. I'm so grateful for your support. Thanks, guys. And as always, thanks for watching. And until next time, have a good one.